Good morning. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Morning, just check you can see and hear me. Yes, Martin. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's 9.30, so we're going to make a start. Um, a warm welcome to everybody. We have apologies from uh, Chris Elliott, uh, non-executive director, so he's hoping to join us uh, later in the morning. Um, Daniel, uh, our chief executive, uh, who's on leave, and Ruth, our deputy, uh, joint deputy medical director and chief executive, who's also on leave. Uh, otherwise, I think we're all here. Um, Meg, you will, or Meg or Barbara will let me know if I'm wrong. I think everyone else is present. Uh, so, are there? It, thank you. Are there, are there any declarations of interest? Um, I will make my usual declaration as joint uh, or as chair in common. Um, I can see Elizabeth and Derek's hands. I suspect Anne as well um, somewhere. Uh, although I can't see her hand right now. Um, as um, given their St. George's interests. Martin? Yes, um, I'm doing some work with um, Six uh, Partnership University Trust. Thank you, Martin. Aruna? And I'm doing some work with the uh, Liverpool University Foundation Trust. Thank you very much indeed. So we will note those. Um, I can't see any other hands, uh, but there's a limit to what I can see on the screen. So if anyone is indicating, uh, perhaps they could just um, uh, uh, it, shout, not too loudly, but you know what I mean. Uh, so just, we will note this. So, um, Gillian, if I may, yes. just one one thing. So uh, in, just going back a little. So um, 
Claire Proudlock is also not here, and uh, James Thornton, who you can see on your screen, who's deputising for her at the moment. So I just wanted to make. Oh, thank you, Peter, for, cl for clarifying that, because um, uh, there's a limit to who I can see on the screen. And if I flick off the screen, uh, then, I, then, then, then I find that quite distracting. So thank you for that clarification. We will add uh, Claire's apologies and uh, welcome to her deputy. Um, so can we move on then to 1-3 and the minutes of the previous um, meeting on the 14th of May? People happy to agree those minutes? Thank you. And then that takes uh, takes me on to my update. Um, I think it'll be fairly obvious that the first thing I want to comment on is Daniel's secondment to um, LAS, which was announced at the end of last week. Um, I think we've got a lot of emotions in our heads as we um, as we look at this. First of all, um, uh, a sense of loss uh, for all that uh, Daniel has done for the trust, for the leadership he's given us, for the friendship that he's given us. And certainly from my point of view, uh, he's been a great chief executive to work with as chair. Um, I think also um, uh, recognition that this is a big job um, with lots of challenges, which I know Daniel will relish and get his teeth into. Um, uh, an opportunity to uh, have a job on a, on a, a regional scale. There's nothing quite like London Ambulance Service. Um, and for me, knowing Daniel's particular strengths, an opportunity perhaps to make a real impact in London on the emergency care pathway by making sure that uh, LAS and um, the various places across London are really joined up and deliver the best possible uh, urgent care for uh, our patients. So uh, I think a whole mix of emotions really, um, as I've described, but I think uh, feathering the cap to ESTH that um, that London Ambulance Service wanted our chief executive to help them on their next stage of their improvement journey. Uh, and sadly, because Daniel's on holiday, he's not going to uh, be able to be at a board to hear us say all, uh, all the things we would want to say about him uh, because he will be joining LAS in the middle of August. So um, I guess uh, knowing Daniel, he, he would say to me, well, I've been spared having to listen to you going on like that. Um, but uh, I think you all know my views that, 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 that people do need to hear those accolades and those thanks. Um, so I'll just have a little practice next time I, I talk to him uh, and, and tell him what I said. And I'm sure others of you will do the same. Uh, so I think we would all want to wish Daniel um, the very best of luck and really look forward to working with him in his new role. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is some of the visits I've been doing across the hospital. And the most recent one, which is very still very fresh in my mind, was when I was at Epsom and um, James and I went to visit Ruth, uh, who was actually working as a doctor at the time. Uh, I, I think um, all the board know that she's a paediatric respiratory uh, uh, consultant and a very expert one. And she kindly... Um, arranged for me to speak to one of her patients because I think you all know um, I always want to hear the patient perspective and it was lovely to hear the difference that uh, the service under Ruth's leadership has been able, able to make to this young person's life it's been completely transformative so so that was a really lovely visit and I it's very much a multidisciplinary team approach and I was able to talk to other members of the team as well. Um, I also had a great visit uh, to Epsom Maternity Unit, uh, which was just terrific, uh, really, really nice. So I've been to lots of places, but I can't take up the meeting by telling you all about them. Um, but they're just two of the most recent that I thought I would mention. And I continue to be hugely um, uh, impressed by the uh, commitment of our staff and their determination to do the very best they can for patients despite the many uh, difficulties they face and, and now um, with rising COVID numbers in the, in the community. And we will talk obviously about the impact on the hospital, but we need to remember that even if patients aren't coming in, um, our, our staff are living in those community, in our communities and, um, and coming up against the problems of, um, of COVID themselves, maybe not getting very ill, um, but nevertheless, not being particularly well occasionally. So um, we're in a different period now, but uh, no less challenging, I think. So I think that's quite enough from me. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, item 15, which is the Chief Executive's update, which James is very kindly going to lead today. James. 
Thank you, Julian. Um, and it is my pleasure to um, present the latest news um, of the Trust to the Board. Um, but as you've mentioned, Julian, it, it is with mixed emotion. Um, and thank you for your very kind words about um, working with Daniel over the past five or six years. And we really do look forward to having a continued relationship um, with Daniel as we support him in his endeavours at LAS and hopefully he can support us at our um, front door in the emergency department too. Um, I, I think we should also note that this is Debbie Ayateo's last board meeting with us. Um, she will be leaving the, the trust um, at the end of the month. Um, hopefully she's leaving on a high as she's presenting the people strategy to the board um, later on this morning. Um, so we look forward to having a, a productive discussion about that and um, setting in train um, the future direction about how we support um, our colleagues to be the best that they can be over the next few years. Um, and I, I think Debbie and Daniel have really worked hand in hand over the past few years with a shared passion um, about having an equitable, just, fair and transparent culture um, for us to work in. Um, and I really do want to um, thank Debbie um, for helping set in train our, our core value of respect. Um, I, I, it, it, we are working in really challenging times uh, at present. Um, and we really do need to acknowledge just how busy our hospitals are. And um, our emergency department has gone through um, record attendances, both of people with relatively minor ailments, but I think as people are starting to socialize again, we're seeing a number of people with quite nasty respiratory infections presenting to our hospitals, whether it's COVID or um, non-COVID reasons. Um, we really have to acknowledge um, and um, say that it's, we have huge pride um, that it was announced in the birthday honours that our chief nurse, Arlene Wellman, um, was recognised for her contribution to, um, to nursing um, and has been awarded um, an MBE. Um, I, I feel huge pride about working alongside Arlene. Um, Arlene has um, huge dedication, huge skills, and you'll see from the report the wealth of responsibilities that she has, um, and she really is an exceptional nurse. So uh, huge congratulations, Arlene. Um, another piece of good news um, is that following the end of the uh, contract um, uh, with Mighty, um, our cleaning, portering and catering teams are being welcomed back um, to be direct uh, employees of Epsom and St. Helier. Uh, these colleagues are absolutely at the heart of our hospitals. Um, and I, I think it's a good testament to the ethos that Debbie and Daniel have um, instilled in us um, about supporting uh, an uplift in their pay to ensure that all staff who work at Epsom and St. Helia, Sutton Health and Care and Surrey Downs Health and Care are paid the London living wage. Moving on to building your future hospitals as ever, um, it's, it feels a bit like COVID. It's a series of sprints, but the whole, the whole thing is a marathon. Um, and Trevor um, and Phil have been working incredibly hard um, to continue to get us closer and closer to building our new specialist emergency care hospital in Sutton. Um, and, have be, and we've been very busy um, in engaging with our stakeholders um, over the past month. In terms of integrated care, um, we were delighted to have featured in the National NHS Providers um, Bulletin showcasing how we can deliver um, high quality integrated care. Um, and there is a link to that report for anyone who's interested um, to get more detail. Our Eurogynecology team um, 
after 18 months of uh, hard work and attention to detail, um, have achieved formal accreditation for the service after an external um, assessment. And I, I think that's really good news for the service, uh, for everyone who works there, but also for um, people who will be using that service. It's a testament of the high quality that people can expect to receive, but it enables us um, to develop ourselves as a, a very significant training centre um, and to be recognised for treating um, women with increasingly complex needs. And then I just want to end um, uh, the report, Gillian, if I may, in terms of just recognising all of our staff. O over the past month, um, we've been celebrating um, the and reflecting um, the experiences that staff have um, gone through over the past 18 months um, in terms of dealing with COVID. Um, we've been really pleased to um, offer every member of staff um, a medal um, and a personalised certificate. And we've been sharing um, experiences um, through individual divisions and services. Um, and it's been hugely touching, but also um, just as I've been so proud to be associated with Arlene, listening to the stories of individual team members, it's, um, it's filled me with such pride to hear their dedication, commitment and flexibility, um, as well as their resilience in coping with the stresses and strains that we've all experienced over the past 18 months. Um, we have one final ceremony at the end of the month as our final batch of medals are delivered. Um, and we look forward to um, celebrating and reflecting with our cleaning, catering and portering teams. So I'll finish the report there. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you very much indeed, James. Um, some of you will know I normally do um, thanks for departures um, at the end of the meeting. So as well as listening to what you've had to say, Debbie's also going to have to listen to me at the end of the meeting. Um, I dealt with Daniel because I felt um, uh, I needed to say something um, at the beginning of the meeting about him and he wasn't he wasn't here. So um, uh, and I also wanted to split up doing Daniel and, and Debbie. Um, but are there any questions for um, uh, James in relation to any of the material that he's covered? I can't see any hands at the moment. So if not, we'll. Oh, Anne. It's not really a question, it's more um, a comment. Uh, many of you know that um, I also chair a mental health trust and some of the work we've been doing has um, demonstrated the importance of wages to mental well-being. And therefore I wanted to commend the trust for the work that you've done in bringing uh, uh, former mighty staff in house and ensuring that they are paid the London living wage, because that's quite an essential component to, uh, to people's well-being. Thank you, Anne. Martin? Yes, um, I just wanted to add as well that there was also another uh, recognition uh, in the national awards from the Health Service Journal for the incredible effort that, that staff and uh, the, the exec leadership played in setting up the Seacoal Centre. So much has happened over this extraordinary period of time. It's, it's easy to, um, for it not to be at the forefront of our minds, just what an extraordinary achievement it was to get that up and running in such a short period of time. Um, and, and although the, the award was actually in, in, in the name of others, you know, clearly it's, um, it was about the team from Epsom and St Helia, so I just wanted to thank everyone. Thank you, Martin. You're so right. Um, and uh, uh, I was pleased to see the Trust Zone publicity about that, which did emphasise the huge team effort uh, across public service, actually, not just the Trust, but I think the Trust did the most fantastic job at SQL. Um, and uh, we, we should be forever proud of, of how we stepped into that. Aruna. Yes, I, I just wanted to ask, um, James, you touched on, um, you know, um, emergency, the um, a and &E and the numbers. Perhaps you could add a little bit more colour. I know you spoke about respiratory 
um, cases, but are we at the point of a tipping point again, or is it still very contained? Aruna, um, are you talking specifically about COVID or are you talking about um, other um, presentations? I'm, I'm talking about in general attendances in A&E. Um, when you say it is really busy, um, are we at capacity, beyond capacity? Where are we in the general? I'll, I'll, th th thank you, Aruna. I'll, I'll let Sue come in, may, maybe, in, and we'll cover it in a little bit more detail when we cover um, the IPR and the COVID update. But we Absolutely. are seeing um, uh, record numbers of attendances um, through June, through our emergency department. And that is extraordinary considering it's summer months when usually we see a dip. And I, I think it, it's a, a very complex picture of things that we are seeing. We're seeing um, a particularly high number of people who are presenting um, with relatively minor illnesses. And I'm sure there are a myriad of reasons spanning primary um, uh, community um, and outpatient care that might be driving that. Um, but in addition, um, we're, we're seeing a small increase in the numbers of patients presenting with symptoms compatible with COVID and indeed being diagnosed with COVID. And we'll touch on that in a little bit more detail. But we are seeing more people, um, currently relatively small numbers, but it, it's, it's a potential uh, cause that we, of, of, uh, or, or an issue that we need to be paying interest in um, uh, for people who are presenting who are quite unwell with respiratory illness that is not COVID. Um, and we're seeing more activity on our acute respiratory units of people who don't have COVID, um, who are requiring non-invasive ventilation and support. Um, and through the course of this week, um, uh, the uh, Sue and Arlene, uh, Philippa and myself have been working with both the intensive care teams and the uh, respiratory teams to ensure that from a nursing and medical perspective, we're making sure that the care is as joined up as possible. Thank you, James. Sue, did you want to add anything? No, I, th I think that's, um, James has covered it. What we have actually looked at some of the data, Arun, and we're seeing a notable increase in referrals from many of our GP practices across Surrey and Sutton. And um, that data now is with um, the relevant people there. And we need to have a discussion as, as to how we're going to manage this in the future. People clearly want to be seen by somebody, um, a person, whether it's in hospital or in primary care. Primary care are extraordinarily busy, but a lot of the primary care consultations are happening through video link or through telephone. And I think we are seeing the impact of that in the hospital. Uh, we're not yet um, over capacity to deal with the amount of work that we've got, but I think James is right. You know, We've got to be careful we don't focus too much on COVID and then miss the other presentations that are coming through that are placing equal demand on, on our services. Um, and suffice to say, if we have a surge of COVID on top of what we're dealing with in ED at the moment, it's going to put us into a really difficult position. Yeah, but we're meeting weekly and escalating as necessary. Thank you, so that was exactly where I was going with this in terms of, and then there's a wave three, uh, we're already busy. Um, but I think you've, you've covered that. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves that this is London wide. I don't know whether it's national, but it's certainly London wide. Um, so, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Um, well, I wanted to just say that James, of course, has been um, um, rightly commented on Arlene's wonderful award and also the HSJ awards. And I'd like to offer my congratulations to the entire team for the receipt of the George Medal, which has been, um, you know, the personal message from Her Majesty and boy, do you deserve it. So well done to all of you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm sure everybody was uh, delighted about that. And I thought the handwritten note from um, the Queen was just so delightful. And she does, doesn't she just look so pleased to be out and about again? I don't think I've ever seen quite so many beaming pictures of uh, 
of the Queen. Right, um, on the strength of that, we were only asked to note the Chief Executive's report, which I'm sure we duly do, um, but I think a really interesting discussion. So thank you, colleagues. I'm going to move on now. Um, unusually for us, we're running a little late, but I'm sure we'll pick up on to item 2.1 and the COVID recovery update. Um, uh, James, I think this is a double act between you and Arlene, and I'm not sure who's going to start. Gillian, uh, I think... I'll start, um, but we can maybe catch up a little bit of time because I think a lot of what we're planning on covering um, is picked up in various agenda items um, later on. Um, I, so, so as Arun has rightly pointed out, um, we're all aware of the increased um, community prevalence of COVID. Um, it has not yet um, translated to anywhere near the same pressures um, within the acute hospitals um, at Epsom and St Helia, indeed southwest London and the rest of London. So we have a small number of COVID positive patients at both Epsom and St Helia and a, a small number of people who are on our intensive care who are COVID positive. Um, but we are anticipating through the months of July and August that those numbers will gradually increase. And we've been working over the past four to six weeks to um, tighten up, refine um, and develop our surge plan for how we manage um, the potential increasing numbers of patients who are going to present to our emergency department with symptoms of COVID whilst trying to maintain elective care because we are acutely aware um, of the, um, the harm to people who've been waiting such a long time to receive um, their treatment. And um, a lot of the work that the teams have been undertaking is um, to work in collaboration with our system partners in primary um, care, as well as the other acute trusts to um, support um, mutual aid. So a number of our patients have been accessing treatment at other hospitals in Southwest London, but equally where we have capacity, we've been helping out some of the other trusts in Southwest London. And that spirit of collaboration is going to be really important moving forward. Um, I have touched on um, the pressures that we're seeing um, through the emergency department. And it's not just COVID um, or, or the direct effects of COVID. We're seeing some of the indirect effects of COVID, particularly with children and young people presenting to our emergency departments. Um, and I'm sure, Anne, as you're very aware, the mental health presentations are um, causing um, quite a lot of challenges to the teams, particularly the paediatric teams. Um, I'll, I'll let Sue talk on about the elective activity, but there's a, we, we had a, a good detailed conversation in our patient safety and quality subcommittee uh, at the start of this week. Um, and I, I notice, Aruna, it's in the, uh, a, a lot of the details in the report, and in particular, um, um, the focus that we need to continue to um, address in terms of reducing the risk of in, um, spreading infection for patients who are admitted or attending uh, hospitals. Um, so I, I think those are the headlines. Um, Arlene, I don't know if there's anything you want to say in terms of infection control, or we could potentially leave that to the PSQ update. Yes, I, uh, I think, yes, we leave it to the PSQ update. The only thing maybe is to highlight that we continue to work um, across Southwest London. So the Director of Infection Prevention and Control, um, we work together with the uh, infection control doctors and the lead nurses um, so that we are aligned across how we manage COVID um, going forward and that has been a real that group um, working together has been a real source of um, strength for us uh, as we're able to, uh, to to deal with issues as they arise in, in a coordinated way. Thank you Arlene. <clears throat> um, any questions from colleagues? We kind of started the discussion under the last item and I've no doubt we'll take it forward um, under PSQ as well. Um, uh, James, you, you said in PSQ, and I think it's probably worth noting in public board, that the, the nature of the patients who are presenting with COVID is now different to 
um, earlier ways. Could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, yes, of course, Gillian. Um, so we have been analysing the, um, the age groups of patients who've been presenting in each surge, uh, as well as the ethnicity. Um, but particularly, we've been very interested in what is the effect of vaccination. Um, we, it, so a couple of interesting things are happening um, in the community. Um, I was at a Pan London meeting yesterday evening, and the current London rates in the community for COVID are that 211 um, people per 100,000 are testing COVID positive over the past seven days. But in the um, age group over 60, the rates are currently at 43. So there's quite a, um, a, a change in the age group of people who are um, being seen to develop COVID. And that is also translating into the ages of people who are being admitted to our hospitals. Um, in the first two surges, um, the majority of our patients were over the age of 65. Um, and there was no difference in the proportion of people who were over 60, between 40 and 60, or less than 40 in the first two surges. But we've seen a total turnaround um, through um, this third surge that the biggest group are the group who are less than 40. And when we analyze the vaccination status, um, it's very clear that we're seeing a very high disproportionate proportion of people um, who have not received two doses of vaccination who are being admitted to our hospitals. And, and I think, Julian, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with the board the continued importance of ensuring that we um, encourage people to have the confidence to access both doses of vaccination, because it is definitely translating into the reduced risk of hospitalisation and serious consequences. Thank you, James. That's, that's really helpful. I know we read it in the newspapers, but I think once we talk about it in relation to our own hospitals, um, the point is, is so well made. So thank you for that. <clears throat> I can't see any other hands. Um, so uh, uh, I think we note, um, we note that report and we move on to the subcommittee reports. Uh, so the first of those is Patient Safety and Quality Committee. Um, Aruna, are you starting? Uh, yeah, yes, over, over to you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so um, we, this is, uh, this is the summary of two um, PSQ meetings, one on the 28th of May, and as James alluded to, one just this, this Monday, really. Um, I, um, I don't intend to go to every, through every single bit of detail. I think we've covered a fair amount of COVID, um, and I think the key point there um, from our COVID report is to say, in spite of the increasing numbers we are seeing coming through um, the door from, for, from an emergency department perspective, um, we are still making good progress uh, on, our, on our wait list, really. So our 52 week um, weekers are, are, are being treated and we're getting through the backlog um, at, at a good pace. Um, we are preparing, as we touched upon, uh, for the surge, uh, a potential third wave. Um, so um, again, I think uh, James touched on that, and um, you know we're, we're we're completely aware of that. Um, we spent a fair amount of time speaking about IPC, and um, Arlene, please do feel to cut. Uh, to come in um, to, to embellish on this. Um, there was an extensive report on lessons learned from um, you know, our experience. I mean, we were all new to this and, and we had a lot of lessons to learn. Uh, there are gaps, um, um, but we, I think it's fair to say we have done everything we possibly can. And the outcome of that is really in May, we didn't actually see any nosocomial infection. So I'm touching wood and hoping that we've done everything we possibly can. Um, I think it's fair to say that the thing we cannot do anything about is our estates. And it's fair to say that the bed spacing, um, you know, on balance, we, we don't have the bed spacing that we would ideally like to have, but that's a compromise we need to make between how many patients we can treat versus 
um, you know, um, the safety. But, but apart from that, I think it's fair to say we have done everything we possibly can. Um, the, um, um, I think um, we continue to monitor um, nosocomial. Um, and as I said, we had none in May. Um, Arlene, is there anything else you wanted to add from an IPC perspective? Or should uh, I carry on? No, that's fine. Just from an IPC perspective, I think in the previous section, we had an update and that paper has gone out to the board on the um, on the board assurance framework that was developed by NHS England last year. Um, and we had an update in March of, of this year um, to the BAF and uh, in the papers, there is the updated BAF document, um, which highlights in green the areas that are new in the update and our compliance against um, those um, the, the guidance. So, um, and, and um, you'll note that in, the, in that document, we are broadly compliant, as um, Aruna has said, our constraint is around our estate, our environment, um, and therefore, uh, which includes just not, not just spacing, but availability of isolation rooms to put patients in who are um, suspected of COVID. Um, and so it is a juggling game all the time with infection control team, staff on the wards, and the site teams working together to ensure that we maximize the use of that for the patients who need them. So that paper is also included in the board papers today. Thank you, Ali. Thank you for that. Um, sorry, could... sorry. Uh, before you go on, Aruna, uh, that was my mistake because um, I'm, I'm working from an old agenda, which is always a mistake, always a mistake to do that. We should have had, um, we should have had the discussion about um, the IPC bath under the COVID item. So when we've um, finished the quality, uh, the, the patient safety and quality report, I will go back to that uh, just so that we can formally deal with it. And my, my apologies. I am trying to look at two agendas, an electronic one and a hard one, and it's an absolute error. Always use the up-to-date one is the message. So my, my apologies for that. And sorry to interrupt, Aruna. No, not at all. I mean, I, I sorry, I picked it and, I, and which is why I pointed to Arlene in particular um to, to to pick up on that but but that's that's fine um so in terms of um we spent a fair amount of time actually in both meetings speaking about fundamentals of care and i think it's fair to say as we emerge from you know our covid experience and start to pick up the pieces there is work to be done on the ground in terms of fundamentals of care um and we are very aware of it and uh, we have um you know made it our area of focus, we will have it at our PSQ meeting every month and we will be looking at this um, in, a, in a fair amount of detail. Um, as it says in the report here, we did do baseline audits and we do recognize that again, coming out of COVID, perhaps our staff are not fully trained and a lot of them, you know, need to do the training once again and refresh, um, you know, their practices, if you like. So, um, fully very aware of that. And, and I think it's fair again to say Arlene and team are completely on top of it and, and know where the hotspots are and what they, what, what needs, uh, what needs uh, fixing are there. Um, on the critical care, we had a presentation. Um, it was, um, so we are going to do a number of, you know, when, when the time permits and if, if the agenda permits a number of deep dives, um, you know, on a rotational basis at PSQ and, um, Critical care was one of these deep dives, and it actually was quite useful because um, it, it's one that is, go, you know, going to be presented to the CQC. Um, and actually, it was very reassuring, um, particularly to know that we have now a new intensive care unit at St Helier, uh, which was completed in April 2020, um, and and a lot of very good, um, uh, you know, measures and, and 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 safety aspects that have been added to critical care. So. It was a good opportunity to get um, um, into the detail there. Um, also to add every month again, we do have an update from the maternity um, group. Um, and um, this one, it, it, indeed, we signed off on the CNSD compliance um, for, for, um, uh, for 2021. Um, and I, uh, I think it's fair to say we don't, we don't actually have any gaps. The only thing again is going back to training and we have committed to make sure that we achieve 90% training 
across our maternity um, um, our maternity staff. Um, apart from that, it was the usual reports. Um, I, I guess the only one of note there that is slightly unusual um, was probably the cervical screening uh, program. Um, again, to just make people aware, there were gaps in, there were 32 actions identified. We have completed 17, we won't lose sight of that. That will come back um, with the action plan and um, us looking at where we are. But as a, as a report, we recognize what work needs to be done and we will be monitoring that. Um, and then there were the usual um, reports to the committee. Um, and I, I think I'll pause there and, and take any questions really. Thank you, Aruna. Derek, was there anything you particularly wanted to add? No, I don't think Aruna's done a very comprehensive review, um, but really if I could just emphasize the, the comprehensive nature of the review that Arlene and her team have done of particularly around um, transmission of COVID-19 within the hospital. I mean, you need to recognize that this is a really transmissible virus and, and keeping infection prevention control measures that, that can contain it within the hospital environment is, is a huge task, but, but there's the rigor in the reports and the um, positive nature of the lessons learned, I think uh, uh, we were very impressed, I think, as a, as a committee with, with the depth and the extent of the work that had been done to, on that subject. Thank you, Derek. I think those points are really well made. I happen to be at that committee and uh, uh, the, the quality and extent of the paperwork was, uh, was hugely assuring. So I endorse that comment. Anne, I can see your hand. So uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, maternity and to what extent we monitor outcomes uh, by ethnicity. Uh, because, you know, I'm aware of the much higher death rate for both mothers and babies in some uh, ethnic groups. And I wondered if that was something that we monitored. Arlene, would you like to take it or shall I take that? Well, you can, Aruna. I think just to say that the data is available. Um, I, we don't yet uh, report it, you know, in, in that way. And that is, we are currently... Um, uh, after PSQ last week, and I think in further discussions with the exec team, looking at um, how we update the page on the IPR so that we address current issues. And, and, and that will be one of those that we will include in future um, reporting. And I think you're, you're, you, 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 you hit, hit on something there. I think health inequalities is something that is, um, you know, uh, front and center of our minds. And um, at this point, certainly from an IPR perspective, we don't receive data that is sliced and diced by ethnicity. And I'm looking at Martin now, Martin can't see me looking at him, but I think Martin and I both feel quite strongly that this is something we really need to do. Um, and um, and um, I know we're working on the patient experience page right now, and um, Sophie is very, very conscious of that. So as she recreates the page, at least from patient experience, broad patient experience perspective, she's very cognizant of that and is kind of going to look to slice and dice it in that way. They are challenges, I dare say, because um, collecting that data um, sometimes is tricky. Um, but, but um, you know, we, I think going forward, we, we must and we have to do that. Thank you, Aruna. And we have had some discussion, I think, um, sometimes outside meetings as well as in about the problems in, in actually getting that data. And, and I have a concern about the fact that that problem should actually be on, a, on our risk register. But that's a debate for elsewhere. Um, I can't see any other hands. So I'm going to ask the board to note this report. And then I'm going to swiftly return to the um, IPC BAF, uh, which I managed to overlook. Um, that's a day with me going to a quality committee I think because it's uh, the debate there is in my head um that's not that doesn't help anyone else at board knowing what's going on in my head um so we're, we're going to go back to the IPC bath under item 2-1 Arlene you've already said something was there anything else you wanted to say um, no the, the only additional thing to say was that when the first, when the BAF first came out last year we were required to uh, report to CQC our compliance against the BAF and there was a meeting that um, 
where our evidence was extensively reviewed with CQC and there were no um, issues identified. Uh, CQC was happy that we were compliant um, with the guidance um, as for the BAF. So that would be the only thing I would add, as I say, the updated um, guidance and the 2021 guidance is highlighted in green in the paper so that um, the board members are able to easily uh, see which, which ones they are. You're on mute, Gillian. I pressed it, but it doesn't always work on, a, on, on one of those. Any, I can't see any other hands. Any other questions or comments? We're asked to formally note this, but as people have said, it was an incredibly thorough piece of work. And I think everybody was very impressed with it. So thank you for that. So now we can return to 22B, which is the People, Culture and Equality Committee, People Focus. Martin. OK, thanks, Chair. So just to set this in context, for the public. Uh, the People, Culture and Equality Committee, there are um, two parts to it really, and we do it in alternate meetings. So I'll report on the first one, which is more about the people and uh, organisation culture. And then the second one is the equality, diversity and inclusion. So at the, um, the People, Culture and Equality Committee that's referred to here, uh, one of the key things was that um, we had an update on the, what was then the start of uh, health and well-being workshop programs for managers. So we, there's a lot that's been said about uh, the impact of uh, COVID uh, and other pressures on NHS staff. Um, and we tried to put in place really effective um, support for that. And part of that, a lot of it comes down to line managers and, and line managers clearly need some training and understanding that. Uh, since then, I was very pleased to have attended one of them myself and, and also did the introduction. Uh, and I found it, it to be very high quality training. Uh, linked with that is also that um, as an initiative in the NHS, it's been decided that all trusts will have a staff wellbeing guardian. Um, and I've been asked and accepted taking on that, that role. So this fitted very well in terms of uh, what we're going to do more of in terms of that world support. Um, recruitment, as always, um, remains an issue. Um, and certainly in terms of uh, nurses uh, and doctors, it's, it's very clear that international recruitment is going to have to play a part for quite some time to come. Uh, which is unfortunate in some respects because we'd all like um, to be able to take lower cost routes uh, from within the UK. Um, but realistically, even with expansion of training, et cetera, it's going to take some, some time before that's effective. Uh, and also there's some evidence that um, uh, the numbers looking for retirement are actually increasing and even if you start by recruiting people at a uh, at an earlier earlier stage in their career you clearly need a balance of experience in the workforce um, also during covid there was a significant reduction and a planned reduction really in the rate of completion of appraisals and of mandatory training uh, and like many things it's really a matter of recovering from that really was the right decision um, to not try to burden staff more with that. Uh, but equally, it's important to get back to the status quo. Uh, the people strategy will be hearing more about. Uh, and the other part and a significant part of this was freedom to speak up. So for those who are less familiar with it, the freedom to speak up guardian role is an independent confidential service, which is provided to staff. So not surprisingly, uh, a, a lot of the reports which come out and and they're very openly considered uh, raise a number of concerns uh, and I think in general that they could mostly be categorized under the, the quality of line management uh, and that's something which is very central to the people strategy because it's an old adage but people join organizations and they leave managers uh, and the, the, the higher quality of people management you can get, uh, the more effective patient care will be. 
So that's the, um, the first part of it. Then in terms of diversity and inclusion, um, one of the things that's a distinct, unique feature in the NHS is that some years ago, they came up with a number of measures um, around uh, how well we were doing really on, on, on diversity in the workforce. And these are, are called RES, uh, and there's also one for disability called WDES. Uh, and they are very openly published and it's easy to benchmark ourselves against them. Uh, what we looked at here was um, our specialists in this area is very well connected with the national picture. And we got some insight in terms of future development of this. And in particular, quite a major uh, initiative is that there will be some specific measures for the medical workforce. Um, which obviously we welcome. One of the key parts of our equality, diversity and inclusion strategy has been the, the growth of the networks, which are growing significantly in recent years, both in terms of the subjects that they cover and in terms of participation. Um, but those who chair them uh, do it, they have to volunteer for, their, uh, for that. And we have managed to agree that they get protected time in a similar kind of way to this protected time for people who are staff representatives or union representatives. Uh, and that's been very positively received by the, the networks and the chairs. Uh, and similarly, these, the, the, the activities in this area uh, really grow and grow. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we've also agreed additional support within the EDI team. These are the professional specialists involved in it. Um, we keep monitoring the um, uh, COVID um, staff vaccination rate uh, and also looking at that um, from a, an ethnic point of view. Um, we had also quite a significant part of the meeting around patient experience and it was pleasing to see this because this committee is about, it's also really about the diversity of uh, of patient experience and the, the, the potential health inequalities around protective characteristics. Just to pull out one highlight from it, um, virtual visiting. Um, this is a service which enables all patients to make contact with their relatives where they do not have their own device to do this. Tablets have been rolled out onto each ward and we're currently advertising the service Leaflets promoting the service have been translated through a number of languages to ensure the service is inclusive. And the reason why I particularly highlight that is that a lot of this is about really practical uh, impacts. So not everybody can afford devices, not, and um, it's important to recognize that uh, and also the use of different languages. So I'll leave it there, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Martin. That was quite a, 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 a quite a range of uh, issues covered there. Any questions to Martin or just comments, perhaps? I'm just checking. I can see any hands. No, I can't see any. I, I thought it was worth just perhaps, Martin, um, reflecting on the, um, the point you made about the support groups and the fact that the trust uh, has now ensured that they will have protected time. And I do hope that that will enable um, those who have so willingly volunteered to, um, to find it a bit easier uh, to, to do, because it's quite clear that people with busy jobs want to be involved in the networks, but um, were struggling with the time available. So I thought that was a really good um, initiative. And you, you did mention it, but I it struck me quite forcibly on Monday during the discussion. I thought it was worth emphasising. <coughs> I can't see any other hands, so we're asked to note both of those reports. Uh, OK, thank you. That takes us on to finance and performance. Anne. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, you'll see that you have the report from both the May Finance and Performance Committee and the June Finance and Performance Committee. And clearly, uh, Richard chaired the, the May Finance and Performance Committee. But inevitably, the, the June updated many of the issues that were discussed in May. So I wasn't going to go through um, the, the May points in detail, other than to note 
that the committee did approve business cases for the transfer of three community hospitals from NHS property um, to the, the trust. But in terms of the, um, the June committee, which obviously I was um, at, um, we had a good discussion around uh, where we are on um, finance. And uh, I don't want to steal all of Rakesh's thunder, but uh, uh, we are slightly ahead of plan, which is, which is good. Um, this depends quite a lot on uh, what happens to what's known as the elective recovery fund. Uh, people will be aware of the huge buildup of uh, patients requiring elective uh, treatment. And there is an incentive scheme uh, in order to try and encourage trusts to perform well in trying to reduce uh, the backlogs. We are, the, the committee was satisfied that actually that we are doing really well against the activity targets and we would commend all the people uh, working on that. And we should be rewarded for that in terms of money. Uh, the fact is, however, Southwest London as a whole is uh, performing really well. And there's a slight nervousness that there won't quite be enough money uh, to cover the activity that everybody um, has managed to achieve. So we have taken quite a prudent approach to that to make sure that, um, that we don't bank on money coming that, that then doesn't, doesn't come. But it feels at this early stage in the year that we are in a uh, strong position. We also talked about cost improvement uh, programs, uh, SIPs. At the moment, uh, the ones that we've achieved, we are on plan, which is good, but the ones we've achieved are non-recurrent, as in we've taken advantage of some underspends that uh, we probably wouldn't want to encourage actually across the rest of the year, but won't necessarily um, reappear. So we, we, we are, as a committee over the next few months, we will want to look at uh, some of the productivity data to ensure that we're taking advantage of uh, saving schemes that are likely to be recurrent because although we don't yet know what the second half of the year will look like I think the smart money is on it being much tougher um, than the first half of the year so we know we need to uh, we need to plan for that. Um, the capital position again we are on plan which is uh, which is good there is some uncertainty in how much capital we will actually get uh, so again, we are being prudent. We are having a number of projects which we describe as shovel ready, as in we're ready to go if the money comes, um, but the money may or not uh, uh, come. But again, uh, the, the committee was satisfied that we're making good progress on that. Uh, we agreed a couple of business cases that will come to uh, the second part of the meeting. Um, that, uh, that around the Epsom gateway, which is office accommodation, that will hopefully alleviate some of the pressures within, within the hospital sites, and also uh, for some um, accommodation around the non-emergency transport, patient transport service. And they will come to the uh, later on uh, in today's meeting. Um, we've covered performance uh, quite a lot. Uh, obviously performance, has both a quality aspect and has a financial um, aspect. Uh, we were um, we were impressed actually with the with the activity that people have managed to achieve. Uh, and I think, as James and others said, you know, the ED department is incredibly busy, uh, and staff are doing really well um, in in managing um, managing that. But that's kind of already been covered. And on elective performance. As we say, we're performing really well, which hopefully will bring in lots of extra money, um, but let's, um, let's wait and see. Uh, and we also look through the, um, the corporate risk register um, and we will probably take a focus on specific risks that the committee covers over the next few months. Um, shall I leave it there, Gillian? And uh, people can ask questions. Thank you, Anne. Um, James. Um, thank you, Anne. I, and I think you've really highlighted the challenge in terms of the tension between performance, the impact on patients and the finances that we're uh, facing. Um, and I, I'm sure Rakesh can give us a little bit more colour that we anticipate that um, the 
incentivization to do more and more activity may become a little bit more challenging as the year progresses. Um, we have really made some good progress over the first three months of the year and, um, and then Sue knows well in terms of the numbers of patients who've been waiting 52 weeks for treatment has fallen um, by two thirds over that period of time. But we, we are anticipating um, challenges um, in performance with a, a workforce that is, is quite tired. Um, and we will need to be really agile in terms of linking it to the, the right financial incentives. Thank you, James. Um, Martin. Yes, uh, I, I wondered if uh, Anne and perhaps Rakesh from a purchasing point of view had any insights in terms of what's happening in our sector with inflation? Because clearly some sectors like uh, distribution and, and construction, they're, they're, there's very high levels of inflation and an expectation that that's going to increase. And I was interested in how much of a risk that might be for us. Can I come in, Gillian? Yeah, I was going to ask, I was going to ask you and Anne, but you got in first, Rakesh, so please do. Okay. Yeah, um, so in terms of inflation, um, well, it's the pay element and the non-pay. So certainly in the non-pay element, Trevor will will talk about the, the cost of material and the, um, the scarcity going up and therefore the, the, the inflation around uh, materials going up. And I think we're seeing that across the board. Um, pay awards haven't really been agreed at the moment, so that will um, so that's to be and that will um, put some costs into the system as well. Look, the inflation is higher than I think people were planning for on, on non-paying materials and, and uh, supplies. So that's going to put a pressure <clears throat> on um, quite hard in some places, isn't it? Um, and I, I guess you don't need to. Uh, uh, no. Good, thank you. Um, and Sue, I was conscious that you might want to um, yeah. pick up the baton from where James left it. Just, um, just very briefly, I, I think Anne's right. We're doing really well with our activity at the moment, which is bringing in the funding. Uh, it's challenging, but we are meeting our targets and our 52 week, wait, week wait position has reduced even further down to 280. So that is sliding down nicely. However, we have got a uh, an issue with our referrals are increasing and we can see that we're just doing a big piece of work at the moment to try and really hone down where that increase is coming from but we can see that we are getting more referrals in from GPs so we've got to be able to be in a position in the near future to manage those first weights really effectively otherwise we're going to end up with this bulge in activity um, you know later on in the year when potentially we're in the middle of winter and we're going to be even more challenged. So I think although we are doing well, we are, we are sort of on a knife edge at the moment and our staffing is fairly compromised, particularly in theatres. We've got uh, quite a number of staff who are taking time off because of children isolating, because they have to isolate. So we, we're losing staff uh, frequently, that, you know, going out, coming back in again. And so it's not easy, but it's, and everybody's working really hard to just try and keep it at that level. But uh, yeah, at the moment, things are going well. It's the beginning of the pathway that we need to watch very carefully. Thank you, Sue, that's really clear. And I think a really big thank you to that uh, really significant reduction in 52 week waiters. I think that's fantastic. Uh, so thanks and well done to everybody for that. Rakesh, I'm sorry, you wanted to come back. I just, just wanted to make a, 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 a subtle point really. Um, our, our ambition, as we've stated, is clearly to reduce the electric backlog um, and um, in a safe way and obviously um, deal with the increased activity, uh, the emergency activity in our ED. Um, I, th I think there's a subtlety that's about that's now changing, which is we have to do those two things within constraint resources and ever constraint resources, I think. And, uh, and, uh, and quite rightly, over the last financial year, um, finance wasn't really a variable that we had to consider, but I think that would be increasingly a, a factor to do these two things within constraint resources and constraint workforce and a tired workforce. 
I think the point really well made, um, Rakesh. I'm, I feel quite anxious about what's commonly known in, in um, NHS parlance as H2, which means the second six months of the year. Um, uh, you can just see it looks a bit like a perfect storm, doesn't it? Reduced resources, uh, winter, um, whatever's happening on COVID, uh, and, and people exhausted. It's not, it's not a great mix. I can't see any other hands. I just check the participant list. So I think we're asked to note that report from the finance committees. Um, and that takes us on to uh, Sutton Health and Care and Surrey Downs Health and Care. Chris wasn't, isn't able to be at public board. So um, he asked Thursa and she very kindly agreed to present it on his behalf. Uh, are you there, Thursa? I am, yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, so in the context of the publication of the white paper, Integration and Innovation, which actually now since the report was submitted is a draft bill passing through Parliament. Um, we've taken the opportunity to update the board very briefly in relation to the place-based arrangements as well as the community services arrangements. Because Sutton um, is within the South West London integrated care system and Surrey Downs is within the Surrey Heartlands integrated care system for this report, we're therefore looking at the two separately, whereas previously the board receives things together. So if I look first at Sutton and particularly around the place-based arrangements, um, and that's around the, the London borough of Sutton. So the governance for Sutton has now been agreed uh, around place-based arrangements. It's consistent with the other places of Southwest London and an integrated care partnership board has been established. The ICP board is chaired by Dr. Dino Pardnani, who is the clinical GP clinical chair for Sutton Borough, and it has representatives from all partner organisations, including Epps and St Helier. It's held its inaugural meeting and it's agreed its objectives for the next 18 months, which are in line with the South West London requirements around a focus around the narrative of place. So to be sure of that um, there is consistency in terms of why place is part of the overall governance structure of the system, what the governance arrangements are, and then what are the major transformation programs. And in Sutton, that relates very much around the development of the primary care networks, um, further integration between health and social care, and um, the, the move towards an integrated IT system. Moving then on to Sutton Health and Care Community Services, where Epsom St Helier is the host and the CQC registered organization for, for the provision of community health services um, to support the progression of the integration of primary community services. Epson St Helier has entered into an honorary contract with Dr. Pardnani, whereby he takes responsibility for the operational leadership of Sutton Health and Care Community Services, accountable to myself as the executive chair and through the established board subcommittees and the executive directors. Um, the focus for our community services in Sutton remains on restoration and recovery, um, picking out particularly the, the key areas around the transformation focus that is very much around the development of virtual wards and multidisciplinary teams, supported by the additional funding that's come from nationally to support the Aging Well initiative, particularly around a two hour community response time. The operational issues as they relate to Sutton are very much around unplanned care activity, and that's the higher complexity and acuity of patients that are being seen within the community. In relation to planned care, whilst acute activity is high, um, Sutton Health and Care is meeting all of its contractual key performance indicators. Um, in relation to quality and safety issues, um, the, the concern is around safeguarding for both children and adults, which are being managed in line with multi-partner policies. Um, and uh, one of the outcomes we believe from the lockdown period. And financial issues um, is the same as for everyone. We have agreed the, the budget and the um, living within the block contract budget with the increasing demands. And the risks are as highlighted there around activity, the constraints of the estate, the health and wellbeing of staff and the financial risk. Surrey Downs Health and Care, as the board will be aware, has had longer established place-based arrangements and is a formally recognized as a committees in common across all of the partners. The subgroup structure is now established for Sutton Health and Care and the conflicts of interest guidance across the, par across the partners 
has been strengthened by two interim non-executive um, director appointments. Um, so that is progressing very well. Uh, we've completed the consultation in relation to um, appointments which fully integrate uh, directors between Sutton, um, Surrey Downs Health and Care as a community partnership and Surrey Downs as an integrated care partnership and moving forward in terms of supporting that development. And across the ICP, uh, a lot of work is going on in terms of um, the development of the programmes. Focusing then on Surrey Downs Health and Care's um, adult community services, we have the agreed business plan. Um, our long COVID service has been recognised nationally and linking with the conversations that have been held about the different age group. We recognise that long COVID will be one of the issues and problems that we'll be picking up moving forward as we come out of this, this surge that is um, developing. Transformation relates again to the Ageing Well programme, the two hour community response and builds very much upon the work that we have in the at home team, primary care networks, operational issues in Surrey Downs. Um, uh, planned care services have been more impacted and we have a recovery plan in terms of uh, getting back to uh, appropriate waiting lists for our planned care services. Um, quality and safety issues relate both to safeguarding but also to skin damage, both of which are attributable to the decompensation during lockdown. And the financial issues are, are, are not so acute and um, the contract is breaking even. The risks above 16 are around patient complexity, staff wellbeing, the introduce, introduction of our new digital system and being able to report in an integrated way across the whole of Surrey Downs and issues relating to um, NHS property services around particularly our community hospital sites. Uh, we've had some issues around contractual complexities across our employer organisations, which we are hoping are now resolving. And we have an issue in relation to the lack of occupational therapists, which results in an impact of flow across the whole system and with social care. Thank you, Sir Thurza. That's very comprehensive. Um, any questions for Thurza? Well, uh, well I do, Thursa, if you don't mind. Um, I was uh, reflecting on the comment you made, uh, particularly in relation to Sutton and actually the contrast with Surrey Downs, where uh, you're, you're, work, you're having to cope with a very high volume of work within very fixed sums of money, whilst staff are you know, still very tired. This must be um, imposing further stress upon people. Uh, meanwhile, patients are wait. Are they are they waiting longer? I just wondered if you could elaborate on that a bit for me. Yes, certainly. Um, so I think in in Sutton, uh, due to the contractual arrangements that were entered into at the beginning of the contract, it's been a particularly difficult year this year in terms of setting a balanced budget. Um, I am confident that we've set it in a way that it can be appropriately managed and that we can provide safe and good quality services. But you're right, it does require a change in practice across some of our teams, and that's particularly around managing workforce um, and demand across teams rather than just within teams. So a lot of the support that we're putting in is about how do we manage demand and capacity across the teams, and then how do we manage the change that that requires, which means that people need to move to different areas across Sutton. I think that's been managed very well, but I think it's probably fair to say it's more of a cultural change for Sutton than it is in other areas. Thank you, Thursa. Uh, but but it's being it, it, you're, you're confident you're well it's managed. able to be managed at the moment. Thank you. And in relation to Surrey Downs, the I was a bit anxious about the lack of assurance around fire safety actions. Is this the um, NHS property services thing? Yes, I mean, it could be that Trevor would want to answer, but yes, it relates to NHS property services rather than our estate services. Okay, um, I'm happy to take it offline, but I, I, I would just like some assurance around that. I can't see Trevor right now, so perhaps we'll we'll take that um, offline further um, with him, because uh, I'm conscious of time as well. But I just needed to pick that up. Can't see any other hands, so we're asked to note um, the the report on Sutton Health and Care and Surrey Downs Health and Care. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to uh, item two three, the integrated 
performance report and I'll, I'll go through um, asking relevant uh, directors if they want to flag up anything over and above that which we've already discussed. So James, you first. Thank you, uh, Gillian. I'll, I'll make a start. Um, firstly, I want to um, note um, that there's an, a change on the um, infection control page, and I'm sure Arlene will pick that up in terms of having transparency in terms of the of COVID infections um, and the nosocomial tra uh, transmissions. Uh, so I welcome that being an addition onto the IPR moving forward. Um, I'll, I'll pick up the mortality page and um, you'll note from the report that our HSMR um, has drifted up above 100, 100 being the expected normal um, proportion, the sort of relative proportion of deaths. Um, we usually track below 100. We had a brief conversation in PSQ about this, about the complexities of analyzing HSMR during a pandemic um, and the complexities of benchmarking um, against previous months and other organizations who might analyze HSMR in different ways. Um, I think it's really important that we provide assurance through PSQ um, about what the mortality data is happening within the organization. Um, and Ruth Charlton has um, commissioned a deep dive into um, particularly areas such as respiratory infections, where we're seeing um, a, uh, some noise coming into the system that might um, indicate a concern. Um, and hopefully we, we can take that more detailed analysis through PSQ. I think that's all I want to say about mortality at the moment, and I'll hand over to Arlene. Thank you, James, and thank you for flagging up the um, HMSR, which, as you say, we did discuss at uh, Quality Committee and must return to. Arlene. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, Gillian. I think in terms of highlights uh, for the maternity page, this is the data that we normally report. As we said, um, we said earlier in the meeting, we are reviewing what is um, highlighted on this IPR so that we are able to address some of the current issues um, or, or report on the current um, issues that we need to, uh, as opposed to the to the ones that we have currently on this page. So this this um, data is 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 largely on changed um, and we have no concerns in maternity um, but we will be updating this page going forward in terms of say staffing our staffing continues to be monitored um, and 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 reported as required we are able to tell we have daily reporting of staffing numbers um, as you know um, and as you've heard our EDs are particularly busy um, and therefore staffing there is is challenged uh, we are recruiting um, and we are looking, we're using bank and agency as much as possible to ensure that we keep the numbers within the required range. Um, uh, our ward heat map, again, this is another um, page that we are going to be looking to update as we have implemented uh, uh, We have implemented a new system for monitoring um, key performance indicators on wards and areas. We're doing extensive work on fundamentals of care and we are going to bring some reports on that uh, in the next couple of months. Um, and as the, the only other um, page is on infection control and as James has already highlighted, we, are, we have started to report on nosocomial infections on this page. In terms of our uh, routine uh, monitoring, we, we remain under the trajectory for C. diff. We understand that new C. diff uh, trajectories are going to be issued in the next month or so. Um, in the meantime, we are using the current uh, the, the trajectory that we had in 2019-20 because we didn't have any last year and based on that we are under the trajectory for that. Um, fit testing, uh, 
figures are on there and we will uh, plan to bring a paper on fit testing but just so that the board knows fit testing requirements have changed in that as an organization there is some new guidance that has come out that says that we need to have different kinds of masks um, and staff need to be testing testing on at least two and so we started work on that um, and on the recording requirements um, and I will leave it there and hand over to Sue, oh, Rakesh. Rakesh. Rakesh, yes, Rakesh, anything that you need to highlight for us? Uh, just just one thing that um, we can cover in Anne's report which is it's an important indicator and will become increasingly important is our better payment practice card which is a measure of how quickly we pay invoices to our particular non-NHS suppliers. So in uh, in April, we were above 95%, which is the minimum threshold. And in May, we did 93%. So we're broadly where we would want to be. So I just wanted to highlight that for completeness to the board. Thank you very much indeed, Rakesh. Um, Debbie? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just two areas I want to um, highlight to the board. Uh, one is around vacancies and just to confirm that we are continuing to recruit and we have volume recruitment campaigns. Um, we've now just uh, recently appointed a head of people and OD for um, Surrey Downs Health and Care and um, that person just took up role um, last week. So um, we will be working with Shona uh, to uh, develop uh, dedicated um, recruitment programs specifically for the community. So just to give some assurance around that. Uh, the other area I wanted to speak about was um, around our sickness absence. And just to break that down a little bit, uh, really. Um, so our, our figure uh, of 4.47% is quite high. Um, I just want to say that this seems to be the trend across London, and we are monitoring that on a weekly basis. Um, out of that figure, 0.36% uh, of that it relates to uh, COVID um, absences. So, so it's clear that, you know, the conversations that we've just been having around um, fatigue and um, staff um, um, well-being is still something that we need to continue to keep on our, on our radar. And I, I asked the team, and I think what we will do is ensure that we bring this forward um, more regularly in our uh, breakdown. What were the uh, top five um, absent reasons for absence? So we have a huge um, category where people haven't disclosed. So we need to uh, dig into that. Um, the others is gastrointestinal um, problems. Um, after that is um, anxiety, stress, and depression. And then we have cold uh, and flu, and then musculoskeletal problems so we are continuing to support staff but I think um, we we um, talked as an executive team around how can we refresh the offering for staff as they as they um, transition um, you know uh, you know in terms of their um, experiences post um, the, the surge and they, as they we get them to prepare for the next surge uh, thinking about the fact that the pressure still continues around delivering delivering care. Uh, thank you, Gillian. That's it for me. Thank you, Debbie. Um, uh, uh, that's very clear. Thank you. And thank you for, for highlighting the sickness position. Um, Sue. Um, thank you, Gillian. I think we've covered uh, uh, most of what I'd want to say, but just to note that we have strong performance in cancer. Um, within planned care, we, our diagnostic performance, also we're overachieving in terms of uh, our performance against business as usual. And you can see that we are meeting the diagnostic standard now, seeing people within six weeks of referral for diagnostics. This is really important as our referrals increase, so does the demand on our diagnostic services. And we need to make sure that we can keep up the pace so that we have the right investigations lined up for those people coming in to see us as new patients. And just for assurance, we are meeting with our teams weekly to run through a variety of metrics associated with plan care. And we are um, conducting harm reviews on those who've been waiting over 52 weeks. So uh, clinicians are reviewing the patients who have waited longer. But as I said before, that number has now decreased from 354 in May to 280 um, yesterday. So we're making good progress. 
that the inf information is as it stands. Within urgent care, um, the only thing again I would like to add in terms of assurance around safety is that although we, we're busier than usual and our time to initial assessment has crept up uh, to about 90 minutes, but um, we are making sure that those patients who attend with really acute presentations are being seen quickly. And if anybody does have to wait longer than an hour for initial assessment, they are patients who've attended with very minor, minor ailments. It's not what we want. And we are trying to manage that um, surge of minor ailments at the, at the front door a little better. But um, just to give you assurance that we haven't got sick people waiting longer and people are triaged initially when they come in within about nine minutes. So we see everybody very quickly. That's it. Thank you. I think we talked about everything else. Thank you very much indeed, Sue. Um, any questions from colleagues on any of the inputs from executive directors uh, around the performance report? No. So despite all that work and all that information, we're only asked to note the report, uh, but, but I hope the board's happy to do that. And that takes us on to the corporate risk register. Uh, Peter. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, so there are just... Uh, in process terms, the corporate risk register, as, as uh, I think many of the committee chairs are highlighted, has been through the, all of the board subcommittees uh, at each meeting. There are two uh, new risks for, for, the, for the board to, to note. Uh, one in relation to the increased activity, particularly through the emergency department and requiring uh, medical wards for adults uh, requiring mental health uh, support. Uh, and that's a, a factor of um, you know, as, as people come out of lockdown and other things and, and the, the pressures on the services makes it particularly difficult to, to manage that. We're working very closely with our uh, mental health uh, provider colleagues, uh, but in terms of the, the immediate impact on the, the patients that we are seeing and having to support, uh, there's a challenge around managing that appropriately and the need for uh, additional uh, registered mental health nurses to support that. So that's the first one that's additional uh, and that's um, a, a new one alongside the uh, more long-standing challenges we've had with uh, CAMS services. And then the second one is uh, just to note the risk around the how constrained the capital equipment, the capital programme is, the amount of capital available for that. Uh, and we're noting that there are challenges around uh, managing uh, the, the work expected within the resource available. And as Anne uh, described, is having you know, other programs ready to go if additional funding becomes available. But obviously that presents a risk in terms of uh, impact on the estate and the projects we're trying to achieve uh, to manage within the finances that are currently available. So those are the two risks that have been added to the corporate risk register. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, any comments or questions from colleagues? can't see any hands let me just check the participant list so um we're asked to endorse note I'm not sure which let's say endorse the proposals to update the corporate risk register as peter has outlined people are happy to do that thank you that takes us on then to three one and the people's strategy debbie thank you chair um i'd like to firstly to just um thank our, our staff as well as the trust board for helping to develop this strategy because um, it was a really um, a truly a collective effort um, and it was particularly helpful to capture the views of the non-executive directors and their experiences from different industries which we were able to um, incorporate in this. So I'm presenting this just to, to ask for board approval of the strategy. It's a really important document that sets out the direction of travel on how we will attract, develop and retain our people um, to help uh, fulfill the trust vision of outstanding care every day. Um, it is built on the trust organisational strategy, as well as the NHS people plan um, and uh, the operating framework. So it will support us also with our huge transformation work, which, which we have, um, you know, moving forward as we embark on um, BYFH and the new um, electronic patient record program. Um, again, just to emphasize the, the theme you know, we've had so far around people and um, health and well-being, there is a huge focus in the strategy around the health and well-being of our staff. 
as well as responding to staff feedback around quality of line management um, and team working. Um, it is also important for me to just mention here that um, um, there will be a fully accountable and financially costed work plan. I think this is what we discussed at the PC meeting uh, on Monday. Um, and we are in the process of having that developed, um, which will fully detail the actions required to deliver the strategy. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, Debbie. And as you say, uh, a huge amount of um, work and lots of consultation. Um, Phil. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, I just like to add that, that I think this is a really important document and uh, it's got a lot of really good things in it which will need to be developed further by you know all the execs and all the teams it's really important that this is owned by the exec and uh, and, and is taken forward which i'm sure it will be um, but I, I you know i think it's a really useful piece of work and uh, debbie's done a fantastic job with, with as she said a wide group of colleagues who've you know who brought this together so i think it's a really helpful piece of work which will drive us forward in this most important um topic so thank you You're on mute, um, Gillian. Thank you, Phil. Um, Anne, did I see your hand? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I realise I've come late to the party um, on this. Um, so uh, forgive me. Uh, I suspect we've probably moved too far down the road. Um, I think inevitably with strategies, the, the temptation is to include too much in the final document. And actually something that was a little bit crisper, certainly if we were trying to explain this to staff, I think would be quite helpful that actually focuses on um, the outcome of all the deliberations and the four and the four pillars. Um, because otherwise I, I, I can see that there's been some really good work done to get to them, but, but getting through all of that before you understand what the strategy is trying to do is quite, um, is quite difficult. And it's a little bit of a mixture of strategic objectives and what is is the starting of an action plan with some of the lists and I think actually disentangling that some of that would be helpful but the one thing I, I didn't really understand was why we would want to refresh our values every two to three years because values to me are so sort of fundamental to the culture of the organization and one of the things and people have talked about it um, is you know above all respect and that's come out to me loud and clear in this meeting I kind of wondered what the thinking was behind needing to refresh that every two or three years seems quite frequent for something so fundamental thank you Anne Debbie would you like to respond yes um, thank you Anne um, those are very very valuable um, comments um, <clears throat> we did actually James Thornton um, our comms Deputy uh, Director, and I spoke about this yesterday around um, how can we put together a document that really summarizes what we are trying to um, say so that we can have something very, very clear and easy to digest for staff. So we are going to do that. Um, the other comment around the values, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, but what we were trying to do is capture the impact of some of the transformation and the collaboration work um that we plan to do so it was in the you know the, our, our um, trust trust strategy talks about um collaboration with st george's collaboration with the royal marsden and we also talk about the huge transformation program that building your future hospital will bring um it it will be remiss of us if we don't think about uh, looking at our values and the impact of those work that those pieces of work on our values and even if it's to say that actually nothing's going to change, uh, then that's fine. And that's why we put that in there. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I think that's that's really helpful. Um, James, I saw you momentarily and then you, oh, there you're back. Did you want to add anything? No, only that um, we will be publishing the strategy if it's signed off by the board this morning and will be distributed to staff with a weekly message which goes out from James. But uh, I think we'll, Get it published today and then we'll look to sort of swiftly have something that makes that more digestible version too so that'll be done in short order thank you james i've seen aruna and peter in that order i think it was peter before me um julian um but 
but that's fine. Just very quickly to add, I was part of the group that reviewed the document. Um, so, so thank you, Debbie. Um, I, I think it's fair to say when we did review the document, one of the things that we absolutely said to, to your point, Anne, is we need a clear roadmap. This is quite a chunky document. You can't implement off the back of this. We need a crisp roadmap that takes us to where we need to get to. Um, and I think that is work in progress. Thank you, Runa. Um, Peter and then Derek. Uh, thank you, uh, Julian. Um, perhaps just a little bit of context around our, the work we did just only a few years ago around why we came up with the value of above all we value respect was on the back of a lot of uh, um, sort of co-design with our staff. And one of the things we made a commitment then was that we would review periodically the progress we've made, particularly around the work around re respect itself and whether there are other dimensions that we might want to stress more clearly uh, uh, over time. So it's, it's uh, as others have said, your values are, there's a, there's a core component of those that are enduring, but it was also to make sure that we are uh, picking through your know, commitments that we've made in, in the past to say, is that, does that still feel like the overriding and singular value? Because it's quite unusual to have a singular value that we express ourselves. So we said that we would review that every few years. Thank you, Peter. That's very helpful, Derek. Yeah, I just wanted to flag up as pleased to see education, training and development as being key factors of what we do for our staff and uh, as you might expect. And uh, just not to forget the, the place of the university in the sector as a potential collaborator for education, training and development alongside the more formal organisations like HEE. Uh, but, but yes, just to commend the inclusion of those aspects within the report. Thank you, Derek and Martin. Um, unfortunately, I'm just going to disappear momentarily because the doors, the doorbells rung. So, Martin, can you talk for long enough for me to get downstairs and back again? Well, I was going to be quick. We'll see. Uh, so, I just wanted to um, say that that when it comes to the <coughs> the action plan. Um, stage it's also about prioritization uh, and, and and for me if we if we could only do three things then i think the most effective things and the most urgent things we need to do are to increase the accountability of line management for the people aspects so that's things like them owning and actioning the survey results and I know a lot of work has been, a lot of work has been done on all of these, but I just want to emphasize it. So that plays a crucial role, the quality of line management that people experience day to day. Um, we need to get some independent review and data on why people leave us, because self-evidently it's better to retain people rather than lose them. And it, it's easy to make assumptions and people don't always tell the whole story and things like exit interviews. So we do need to, to get some independent research, to get some solid data to understand the reason why, why people leave. Uh, and lastly, as I mentioned earlier on, it's got to be a major focus on international recruitment, particularly for nurses and doctors, because sadly there isn't going to be anywhere else to go. Uh, and we are uh, competing against an enormous number of, of other people and, and we have at least the huge advantage that even more after COVID that the NHS is hugely attractive to many people around the world uh, as is London so working together with others in London I'm uh, confident we can deliver on it thank you Thank you, Martin. Um, happily, I've managed to get back. I had to let the plumber in. So I'm hoping he isn't going to start asking me lots of questions that will interrupt our board meeting and I won't be able to answer anyway. Um, so uh, thank you for, for all those points. I, uh, I thought they were all really helpful. Um, I'm hoping that the four pillars, which I think are a real strength of the strategy, will come forward very clearly in the, um, the kind of easy to read document a bit of it for staff. Uh, clearly, the work plan is um, uh, is really, really um, important. And Rakesh made the point um, wisely. Um, all, everyone endorsed it at uh, the people committee about it had to be properly costed um, in order to 
us to be confident that we could deliver it. Um, but I do think it's a really important step for the trust to have got to this stage. I think it's um, a, a lovely um, uh, last presentation, Debbie, for you to the board. Um, and I know you're with us for a few more weeks, but a lovely note to go out on, actually. So I want to uh, thank you uh, for all the work you and your team have done on this. And we're asked in the context of all of the discussion to approve the strategy. Is the board happy to do that? Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so that takes us on to item 4.1 and the responsible officers report to the board. I hope Steve's with us somewhere. I can't see him yet, but presumably he'll speak and then he will appear on my screen <laughs> as if by magic. And we've got two reports uh, for 1920 and 2021. Steve. Oh, hello. You're there. Hello. Yes, hello. 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 <laughs> and uh, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I want to start by um, echoing James's uh, comments about working with Daniel and uh, Debbie and Arlene. And I also want to add my own personal thanks to Laura Neal, who's our revalidation officer and without whose help, I wouldn't be able to function in my role as responsible officer. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm my, in my working life, I'm a, a jobbing endocrinologist, but I'm also, I took over from Martin Stockwell as the um, responsible officer in 2019 and uh, you will have before you the 2019-20 and the 2020-21 two reports. And I'm just going to summarize these um, and give you the key points. So um, the key points about 2019 were that um, internally we switched from uh, one system known as Equinity to a much better more user-friendly system called SARD. And this system is now widely used by a lot of our neighboring trusts and it's configurable. It allows us to put in uh, tweaks that make it more appropriate for us. And uh, we've actually improved it a lot. Most people find it easy to use and it's helpful. And it's particularly useful for uh, reflections, which I'm very keen on when we, get, when we appraise people. So um, that was a big step forward and SARD system is up and running and everyone is hopefully quite used to working with it. Uh, the second main point from 2019, as I don't need to remind this group, is the appearance of our pandemic. And there's good and bad um, that came out of this. Um, obviously, we were advised to uh, defer a lot of the appraisals. They were put back one year. Um, this meant um, a lot of people, were, the pressure was taken off the, the need to do a lot of the work for the supporting information for the appraisal. But the good thing that came out of it, and I think will persist, is that appraisals have become much more supportive, much more about uh, doctors' well-being. And um, that, I think, will um, change the way we look at appraisals in the future, rather than just being a tick box of, have you done this? Have you done that? Where's your mandatory training? Where's your CPD record? It's much more about uh, how you're dealing with the stresses of your work. How can we help? How can we support you? And the, the, the well-being of the doctor is um, at the forefront of the, what we now call lighter appraisals. But I'm, I'm going to say that that's going to be the theme for future appraisals. So um, in your in the first report, the 2019, those were the two big issues, the SARD and uh, COVID coming along. In the current year, obviously, we haven't finished that yet. Um, we are uh, picking up on appraisals, which had been deferred. They're now uh, up and running, um, and there's quite a good uptake. Uh, we've recruited more appraisers um, than ever before. We've now got 104 appraisers for 600 odd doctors. So each appraiser has got a maximum of six doctors to appraise. 
um, we are continuing to get people interested in doing uh, appraisal uh, learning to be an appraiser and then taking on that role, which is very encouraging. Um, and we have a quality assurance a tool, which is called ASPAT. And what we do is we randomly look at two appraisals every month and ensure that all the elements of that appraisal are correctly in the appraisal. And um, the end of the year, we look at all the uh, random ones. So we'll get a collection of um, maybe 30 or 40 appraisals randomly looked at and ensure that they are being done properly. And we feed that back to the appraisers. So um, I think the board needs to know that we are up and running, that there was a hiatus with COVID, as you would expect, that the nature of appraisals for doctors has changed in, in, my, in my view in a good way, in a, in a supportive way, and that um, recruitment for appraisers is good, doing well. And I'm very pleased with the interest that we've got. And hopefully that will allow us to um, appraise people more and in a timely way and ensure that everyone is um, revalidated in, in good time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, mm. uh, Steve. That's very mm. good to hear all of that. Mm. Um, any questions or comments from people? James? Um, just a, a brief comment and thank you for the report, Steve. And um, yeah. I, I endorse everything mm. that you've said. I, I think it's pro probably worth noting um, that at the end of this month, we are anticipating um, an external quality assurance visit um, mm. in terms of our overall approach to revalidation and the, the support that we offer um, Steve and his team, as well as um, doctors through the appraisal process um, and the quality of those appraisals. So we look forward to that and reporting that back appropriately. Yeah, thank you. Any other points from colleagues? Can't see any other hands. Um, I think that's that's always a comment on the thoroughness of the reports, mm. if I may say so, mm. Steve. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the so the the, the board. Mm. I'm just trying to scroll mm. to the um, mm. the relevant um, recommendation that is before the board in your report. Oh, can I just um, yeah. can I just ask a quick question before yes. I do that? Um, you talked about um, in the um, second report, the goals mm. for the year ahead, including the appointment of an appraiser lead uh, yes. to provide leadership and, and support. Is that going to happen? Yes, uh, we are. We're, there's two models. One would be a lead for the whole trust or a divisional lead for each division. Um, I'm more in favour of the latter because I think it would be a huge task. And in a way, I kind of consider myself the appraisal lead for the whole trust. So, yes, it would be very useful to have leads within the division for appraisers to go. I should say that we have appraiser kind of user meetings so that we get feedback and they, they bring us any concerns they may have. So that's already happening and that happens um, fairly frequently. So are you confident you're going to be able to get the support you need to make this happen in the way that you would like? I think there's sufficient interest that we will get uh, people coming forward. I would hope so. There may be some divisions who are less forthcoming, but we shall see. Okay, so you might have to give them some gentle encouragement. Gentle encouragement, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. So um, the board, mm. we're asked to note the assurance provided, which of which I think we the reports mm. uh, are extremely mm. thorough and thank assuring, you. certainly to me. Mm. Note the continued pro progress being made against uh, the backdrop mm. of COVID. And again, I think mm. the reports demonstrated that really mm. clearly from a personal perspective point of view mm. and mm. confirm our commitment to supporting the progress of this work i'm sure i have yeah. the board's endorsement of all of those okay. uh, lots of nods and our thanks to you steve mm. for no. all you do in this thank, thank you chair thank you very much uh, mm. and we look forward mm. to hearing about more progress next year oh, okay very many thanks mm. okay mm. right um that takes us on to uh, item 4 to the guardian of safe working report 
Um, is this Andrew or is it you, James? I think you're going to deal with it. Uh, no, it's important that Andrew does it so that um, I'm at arm's length from it. Yes, that's what Andrew I thought. Is, I can't see Andrew yet. Is, is, are you he's there, here. Andrew? He's here. Right. Once you start speaking, you pop into the centre of my screen. So, um, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I can, and I can see you as well, Andrew. Warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, can I just add my um, personal thanks to um, Daniel and the board for providing a uh, uh, great deal of stability for um, staff over the past few years as well. And I think, I think Daniel's done a wonderful job um, over the past few years um, for us. Um, right, so this is the report for the fourth quarter of 2021, um, going from January through to March um, of this year. Um, as you can see, we had a rise, slight rise, there was a slight rise in exception reports in January compared to December, and then the numbers of exceptions drastically tailed off um, as the second wave of the pandemic um, receded. This was slightly different, uh, slightly different pattern from the first wave, when the exceptions dropped off dramatically at the peak of the first wave and then took time to recover. We're still looking at a bit of a recovery time as we go into the um, following quarter, starting from April. But we certainly haven't seen in this quarter for this report. Um, a return to anything like the pre-pandemic levels of exception reporting. Um, as with previous reports, the foundation doctors remain most likely to exception report with the, found, uh, the first year foundation doctors more likely to do so than the second year foundation doctors. And the trend is for less reporting as the doctors become more senior. Um, the representation of grades and exceptions is broadly in line with the equivalent um, equivalent quarters, but comparisons are difficult to make um, at present just because of the uh, situation we find ourselves in in the pandemic. But just for example, um, in this quarter, it was about 85% were foundation doctors, whereas the equivalent quarter from the previous year it was 65% foundation doctors. And then you had 20, so for this quarter, 12% were ST1, two doctors, um, an equivalent for last for the previous year was 26%. And there's still very few ST3 and above doctors, exception reporting there. Um, for fairly obvious reasons, the medicine uh, director remains, remains the most represented um, in exception reporting, but that's hardly surprising due to the pressures put on them in the pandemic. Um, the vast majority of the exceptions are for hours worked. And again, most of those would be for um, two hours or fewer of, it, of extra time worked. In this quarter, we only had one missed education opportunity reported, um, but I think there will be um, a great deal of under-reporting of exceptions. Um, we had six immediate safety concerns reported. However, most of these were actually documented and reported sometime after the occurrence of the uh, incident. However, all were managed well by the trainee at the time and appropriate escalation to senior staff was made um, at the time of the incidents as well. We had no work schedule reviews in this quarter, oh, and I didn't have to levy any fines because there were no finable breaches um, reported at all. There was an extensive redeployment of doctors to intensive care and doctors seconded to other areas for the second wave, but certainly much to a much lesser extent than the first wave of the pandemic. Um, De-escalation plans for a change in medicine um, rotors were requested and received before the enactment of those COVID rotors at the beginning of January. Um, and as the uh, quarter went on, the you know, pandemic, um, uh, the second wave receded, the um, surge rotors were taken off and juniors back to their normal places of work and normal rotors. Um, I did write to all the juniors at the start of January outlining the decisions regarding road to escalations 
and what support they should expect and what to do with difficulties encountered with the rotors and such like. Um, and there was a general appreciation and recognition of the need for extra shifts in the medicine rotors once the second wave was with us and that was despite an initial reluctance um, to want to change, um, make changes to rotors and such mostly with an extra weekend being put into, into the um, rotors and some extra nights as well. Um, we had some issues with rostering and payments for the doctors uh, in ICU in the second wave, which were resolved in an exceptionally well chaired meeting by one of the anaesthetic registrars um, with the intensive care senior doctors management um, and obviously the junior doctors involved and that was all, and that was all resolved very well and um, extremely well done. Um, the Generally, the trust and directors have learned from learned from the first wave to enable staff planning for the second wave. Um, certainly, for the junior doctors, an exception reporting of feedback would indicate that this was uh, generally well managed. And I asked the board to note that report. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That was really clear. Can I just see whether there are any questions from colleagues? Um, I've got a hand uh, from Martin and then James in that order. Hi, I'm not sure um, how much this, this is answerable, really, but I just wondered, I'm thinking more about the while doctors are actually in medical school, so the, 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 the doctors who will be coming to us on placement, and, and what impact has, the, has COVID caused in terms of disrupting their education and training, and to what extent we're able to provide any additional support to them? Um, I think that's going to have to be a question for the undergraduate dean, um, to be quite honest. I can only give you my experience with um, critical care and anaesthetics, which doesn't, the, the, the undergraduate curriculum there doesn't involve a huge amount um, for them because anaesthetics and critical care is very much a more postgraduate um, specialty, but certainly we didn't receive any student. We, you normally, we normally have um, five final year students in six blocks um, in anaesthetics and critical care. And in order to make up time for them, um, their anaesthetics critical care attachment was cancelled, so they could make up time in the in the in the more base uh, in in the you know the more represented specialties such as medicine and surgery. Um, as such, I did I did take a. Um, an elective student from St George's, um, but you know that that was an entirely voluntary thing on thing on the students' part. But I think for the most part, your um, your question would be best answered by the undergraduate dean. Thank you, Andrew. We can follow that up outside the meeting, James. Um, so I, I just wanted to endorse the comments that Andrew made um, and to thank Andrew for his continued work as guardian of safe working practice. It's such an important role. Um, and I think we've learned a lot over the past two or three years in terms of the close liaison and support that the chief registrars can um, offer to promote a culture of um, reporting both work practice um, exceptions um, as well as potential concerns about safety. And um, I, I don't want to be complacent about the reduced number of exception reports. I think we need to keep a really careful eye and I actually hope that we start to see uh, an uptick uh, as the COVID pandemic um, pressures ease, because it's such a useful way of triangulating um, potential concerns so that we can adapt to um, the issues that are being faced on the ward. Thank you, James. Aruna? I just wanted to also acknowledge and thank, thank Andrew for the work that he's doing. I mean, I think we, ought, we should recognise that our junior doctors are our pipeline for the future. If, if there is a good atmosphere and people feel happy working in the hospital, the likelihood is we will get them back as consultants. And I think good example in point is one of our chief registrars has come back to us as a consultant. Um, and I think that that is credit to the work that Andrew's doing because he, he's come back because he thinks it's a great place to work. Thank you, Aruna. I think Andrew, a last word if you'd like one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, this is going to appear in my report for the um, quarter April to June, but um, I have commissioned Jalpa, uh, I've commissioned Jalpa to do a survey 
of trainees' attitudes to, or junior doctors' attitudes to exception reporting. We are certainly not, um, the evidence that we have from publications is that um, exception reporting is underutilized, um, but also that we have had um, mention at junior doctors forum of um, trainees being um, discouraged from exception reporting. And I have written to supervisors um, outlining their roles and responsibilities to exception reporting, but that, that, is, in the, that is in the next, um, coming up in the next quarterly quarterly report. Thank you, Andrew. So as a board, we're actually asked to do more than note the report. Uh, we certainly have to note it. Um, and generally, the trainees appear to be working in a safe, responsive environment. We're uh, asked to note the short notice change in medicine work schedule and um, to acknowledge the continuing great efforts put in by junior doctor workforce in conjunction with the whole team. And I think we would, um, we would want to, to, do, to do that most wholeheartedly. So thank you, Andrew. Um, if we could agree what I've just outlined, I would be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, so Andrew, you can escape back to whatever it is you're meant to be doing. Thank you. Um, that takes us on to the uh, report from the Audit Committee, Elizabeth. Um, hello, thank you, Gillian. Um, this, this meeting is the July meeting, which was the year end meeting to consider our very important governance document. And um, the objective of the meeting was to recommend those documents to the board for approval. And of course, as you know, that recommendation did follow through and the board has approved all the documents. So just to recap on our financial statements, which are our financial accounts, we will be receiving an unqualified audit opinion from KPMG. Um, that is what is known as colloquially as a clean audit opinion. And that is very, very excellent news. And um, we should congratulate um, Rakesh and his team on that. The annual report was also considered at this meeting and um, several colleagues have already commented on the huge effort that was made last year. And I really would recommend people to reread the annual report because our memories are very short. And it's only when you look back and see everything that was done that you can get the full complete picture across the horizon. Um, the third report that KPMG were asked to give an opinion about is the value for money report. Um, and as Rakesh and I know, we do have, we, well, we have in the past had comments and questions from members of the public as to why we haven't been able to demonstrate an unqualified um, value for money opinion. And I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to say in public board that this year, the value for money report will be getting an unqualified audit opinion. And this is a huge achievement that demonstrates the financial grip and the operational sustainability that the entire team have put in and to have achieved it under such difficult circumstances is really noteworthy. Um, and we should mark that. Um, I'm just going to make a final comment about the discussions that the audit committee always have around cybersecurity and information governance. Um, every year we have to complete more and more um, due diligence checks to report to NHS Digital on this. And it is becoming a bigger and bigger part of our um, surveillance operations. Um, just because we are the NHS, we are not immune from cyber attacks and we have to remain absolutely vigilant on this and keep the um, keep up the good work. And it's not just a responsibility of the information governance team, it's a responsibility of all of us. Because our, as you've heard me say before, Gillian, our first and last line of defense are our staff in this matter. 
um, and the damage that a successful attack on us could do could be quite significant. But at the moment, we are holding our own against um, the threats that there are out there. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'm delighted to take them. But I think we should say well done to the entire team for the past year. You're on mute, Gillian. I keep pressing the thing, but not hard enough. Thank you. I was trying to endorse Elizabeth's comments about thanks to the whole team and Rakesh and his team as well, as a particular part of that. Peter. Thank you, Gillian. It's just really uh, in response to Elizabeth's comment about cyber security. So since the, the that meeting's taken place, we've now fully completed uh, this year's uh, data security and protection toolkit uh, uh, and have passed that with the necessary level of compliance. So that's uh, complete. And uh, I'd like to record my thanks for the support of uh, the whole team who've uh, enabled that to happen, particularly in the information governance space, as well as in IT. And of course, to all staff who've done their training. I think you're so right, Peter. I think the cybersecurity stuff is absolutely vitally important and getting the kind of level of uh, commitment from the whole organization is a real achievement so we're we're asked to note um, the report uh, if people are happy to do that and I'd also like to add my thanks to Elizabeth um, who um, as our audit chair oversees all of this and uh, I have um, great confidence knowing that uh, Elizabeth's guiding hand is on the tiller so uh, thank you Elizabeth as well as our thanks to the rest of the team and Rakesh. Um, so that takes us on then to, we're nearing the end, which is just as well, because we've overrun a little bit. Uh, item four for our corporate priorities. Peter. Thank you, Gillian. I will take the two items together rather than draw them out separately. So um, the second item is basically a part of the closing down of last year, which is basically the quarter four assess, quarter three, quarter four assessment of against the corporate priorities we set ourselves from last year, particularly uh, reflecting the, the new trust strategy published last September. Uh, that's been through the uh, board subcommittees for discussion uh, and challenge, and in part informed the work that was then, that, that people will see eventually in the annual report and accounts around our overall performance against all the things we set ourselves for last year. So that's the second document. Uh, happy to take questions on that. The looking ahead, the, um, the first attachment is the corporate priorities for the year we've just started and are now in. It is consistent with the, the work we did in our trust strategy last September and has been refined yet again in light of further experience around uh, the pressures that staff and patients have faced dealing with the, the evolving COVID pandemic. Uh, and one of the, the components that we've uh, already heard about through various board subcommittees and in the people strategy is the work to support our staff in giving of their best. The other component which we've touched on, which has sort of had some debate amongst uh, uh, board colleagues, is making sure we play our part around addressing health inequalities. So uh, people will recall all our strategy said two, two things around addressing inequalities. One was our duties as an employer, and in part, that's uh, we've demonstrating that through uh, onboarding more staff uh, than the, the living wage for, for uh, support staff, which is uh, one key plank. But the other key plank is uh, how we play our part in the wider system in tackling wider health inequalities uh, in the communities that we serve. And so there is clearly as colleagues have said, there's ongoing work to do to say, how do we understand how well we're doing and are there areas that we need to focus on particularly, but also recognizing that this is something that we can only do with, with system partners across health and social care, and indeed the wider determinants of health involving your housing and employment too. So uh, the corporate priorities are here for the board to uh, approve, uh, subject to any further comments that colleagues may have. Thank you, Peter. Um, as you say, there's been quite a lot of discussion on this. Comments or questions from colleagues? I can't see, I can't see any. Uh, but I think, again, that's a measure of the fact that we've had quite a lot of discussion on this. So we're asked to approve the proposed corporate priorities. 
uh, for the year that we're now in. And as Peter said, note the um, content of the quarter for Bath. Are people happy to do that? Yes, lots of nods. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so that takes us to uh, item 5.1 for noting, which I'm sure we're happy to note, uh, the contracts over uh, 50,000. Um, and then to any other business. So the uh, any other business is actually that this is uh, Debbie's last meeting, as Jane said at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, I think, um, Debbie, the board will want to join me in thanking you for the leadership that you have shown, uh, the progress that we have made uh, under your leadership, uh, I know as part of the executive team. Um, and I think very fitting that at this, um, uh, your last meeting, we should have uh, endorsed the people's strategy. Uh, I would also though like to um, add a couple of other things. I think you've led um, the vaccine effort in an exemplary way, in your own quiet way. Um, you, um, you rarely make a fuss. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard you raise your voice, uh, even when you're exhorting people to do things. But I think that is an absolute credit to, to you. And I know a lot of other people, but your leadership of that area is something that I would particularly like to highlight. Um, and the other thing I'd like to mention is that your, uh, your kindness to people, um, which is, I think, often goes unnoticed, but I have noticed you um, being very kind uh, in situations and to people. Uh, and I just wanted to um, thank you for that. And to say how much we will miss your uh, quiet uh, determination that gets on and gets stuff done. Uh, and I want to wish you the very best for the future, Debbie. I know your plan is to have a bit of a, a break. Um, you stayed with us almost, you know, well into summer, where I, I think actually you were hoping to spend some of the summer, you know, um, resting and uh, recuperating and thinking about what next. Um, but whatever comes next, uh, I want to thank you uh, wholeheartedly for all that you've done for the Trust and say that um, I know that we will all miss you. Um, and uh, even though you're somebody who doesn't make a lot of noise, like some of us, like me, for example. Thank you very much indeed, Debbie, and all the very best. Uh, little clap. If I knew how to do the little clap sign, I would do that. And Debbie, I know you'll hate it, but I think you, would you like just to respond? Um, thank you very much, uh, Dillian, and thank you, colleagues. Um, it's been a wonderful uh, time with um, Epsom and St. Helia, but you're not getting rid of me because you're, this is my local hospital. Um, so um, I'll be watching uh, on the sides, hoping to see the new um, curved such building, not a, not a square one. Um, so uh, yes, so thank you. Thank you for your support. And uh, Gillian, you're right about the, the break. I, I thought I was going to have a break, but actually I'll, I'm, going, I'm going quite quickly to my next um, NHS assignment. So uh, thank you very much for your well wishes. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Some other people want to say something. So Derek and I think Aruna, uh, possibly others, but I've seen Derek and Aruna. Can, can I just say, um... The, Debbie may not remember this, but at my first board meeting, when I came into a room of complete strangers, it was Debbie that made me feel welcome. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. I think that absolutely endorses the point I was making. Not a lot of fuss and noise, but real kindness. Uh, Aruna, I did see your hand at one point, but it's gone down now. I, 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 I put it in the in the chat, but ah, I'm right. very conscious of time. I just wanted to say thank you. And it's been a real pleasure uh, working with Debbie um, and you said just such so the right things kindness and quiet confidence um, just gets it done just kind of gets on with it and gets it done so um, thank you Debbie for for everything and um, it, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you Aruna for those remarks and I know Debbie that uh, not everyone's spoken but I speak on behalf of um, all colleagues. Um, so uh, that takes us to the date of the next meeting which is the 10th of September and um, that ends the meeting. There are no written questions uh, today so um, we don't um, we don't have to detain ourselves there and I think um, we will have a 10 minute break before we start so people can stretch their legs and, um, uh, and grab a cup of coffee or whatever it is they want to do. And I suggest we resume at 10 to 12, which is five minutes later than planned. But I think we can probably make up a bit of time in part two. 
Thank you all very much.